Today we're going to talk about uh, the performance of shadow boxes in curtain wall assemblies. And, and I'd like to first acknowledge some of the co-authors of the papers that are on your thumb drive. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Michael Krog, uh, Neil McClelland uh, of HOK, and Larry Carberry uh, at Dow Corning. Um, uh, many of whom are in this room and uh, again, honored to uh, present this to you on their behalf as well. What we have before us is a desire to build vertically, a desire to increase density, and part of that increased density is to, is to continue to build vertically. And what we have harnessed and, and evolved as an industry to come to realize that uh, uh, glass and aluminum curtain walls are, are really the economical function to clad and provide that exterior uh, uh, envelope and that separation between the interior and exterior space. And in that context, you know, there's the, the vision com uh, component in our desire to ensure that we have the appropriate balance between daylight and, and, and shading coefficients and glare reduction. And it, it, the aluminum, glass and aluminum curtain wall comes with uh, the aesthetic appeal, uh, the, um, the capacity to transfer uh, nature's forces and, and loads uh, through a, a slim envelope design. Uh, and through that offers a great deal of design freedom in terms of uh, uh, types of articulation in the wall or choices of material, which render itself into uh, and lends itself to a higher degree of aesthetic flexibility and, and, and design freedom, both on the, uh, on the visual impact level and on the performance level. Um, of course, over the years, the number of years that we've dealt with aluminum, glass and aluminum curtain walls, We've uh, developed our, uh, our collective standards and we've done our, uh, we, we know how to analyze the systems. The performance characteristics are predictable both on paper and in the laboratory settings. And, uh, and these are validated typically uh, through some of the natural events that, um, that uh, our building, buildings and building envelopes are, uh, are subjected to. Uh, not least of which, at least here in the context of, uh, of our geographic area today, high wind loads, uh, typhoon situations, rain, heat, humidity, and of course, solar radiation. And in the context of the greater China area, at least uh, we have the consideration of thermal performance, which uh, as you'll see later in this presentation, we'll, uh, we'll be focusing on. Part of the glass and aluminum curtain wall design is the, the, uh, the, the, the application or the use of a shadow box uh, uh, in the non-vision areas. Uh, there will always be a non-vision component to our, uh, to our glaze systems uh, at our slot bypasses for various reasons which include uh, you know, just uh, fire stopping and fire separation, if nothing else. And in trying to ensure a maximum flexibility in the aesthetic approach, a lot of these shadow box uh, applications are, are glazed and they, well, they're exactly that, they're shadow box to, designed specifically to, uh, to, to either provide, impart a specific um, aesthetic appeal. Um, we'll be looking at current performance characteristics of how we do them today, uh, current issues that are, pos that are associated with the, with the use of shadow boxes and, of, of course, without diving into certain philosophical design approaches and, and, and detailing, and, uh, and perhaps have a discussion and have a dialogue about uh, what potential next generation opportunities uh, belie, uh, lie before us in terms of addressing some of these uh, technical and performance issues. Just a, you know, to wet the palate again with a little bit of imagery, uh, we have um, various examples of glass aluminum curtain walls in various shapes and forms and, and uh, different aesthetic treatments. And it's amazing how a rather narrow palette of materials can actually impart such a varied uh, visual impact and uh, to a degree a, a, a performance impact as well. And in saying that, we have uh, we, to, to go back to the point that was raised earlier, we have this great opportunity to impart different aesthetic opportuni uh, opportunities uh, you know, uh, to align with the, uh, the, uh, 
design intent or the, the uh, design brief from the, from the client to, to specific architectural preferences and, 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 and integration with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the local context. Let's go through how we do it today. A typical shadow box that you would see today is um, exterior light of glass, typically that uh, similar to a vision light um, and it, it will be separated by anywhere between 50, perhaps 75 millimeter space, two to three inches. Uh, there will be a metal component here which is finished architecturally to impart a particular visual impact. It could be colored in, in a shade of gray or white that would provide that uh, potential for seamless visual um, um, uh, observation when you look at it from the exterior. And then there's this thermal insulation component over here as well. This is by and large generically how I would say without being too technical or accurate about it, um, probably 80% maybe if not 90% of the shadow boxes that are out there. And there's certain examples of how these, this type of construction is, uh, is, uh, is provided. And as you can see, is this one basic design concept has this great potential to impart different types of appearances. From a, from a monolithic look to a striated look to a boxed, uh, to a boxed out appearance to the ability to provide some articulation in that non-vision area as well to create some interest on, the, uh, on a particular building. And in some cases, the opportunity to do it two different ways or multiple different ways on a particular construction type. And not least of which to provide an aesthetic or a visual impact. But with this, we have current challenges. And the current challenges, as mentioned before, they're going to be very fundamental in terms of how we want or how we need, from a design perspective, uh, uh, building enclosures to perform. We need to have a barrier against the elements in terms of water, wind, rain, air, water, and thermal. And through this, We've designed over many years, but at the same time, we validate with a test. And through performance mock-up testing, we, take, we manage and handle the air and water and structural perspective of, um, uh, of the curtain wall design. And in North America, it would be in the context of the AMA 501 and other geographic areas or other uh, test methodologies available to us. But they all kind of say and do the same thing. We want to make sure that the components and the system will remain where it is when it's under design conditions, and we have elected to use 50% overload as, as, as the design criteria. That's for air, water, and structural. Now, of course, there's the thermal component where, uh, where those projects that do look uh, uh, deeply into that and want a really concrete and, and quantified number is to validate through uh, validate models and thermal models through hot box, um, guarded hot box testing. These are done in the laboratory. Then there's the, the visual impact that also, uh, uh, that we need to be really uh, conscious of when we manage and deal with these shadow box applications. There are those sometimes intended, but most often unintended uh, effects and impacts of certain shadow box approaches depending on the patterns that are chosen on the, out, uh, on the outer light or on the inner light in terms of combination. And they can, uh, depending uh, on the environmental um, um, conditions, uh, being sort of sunlight reflection from adjacent buildings or just a, when it hits a certain angle at a certain time of day, well, we have a phenomenon which is called the Mori pattern or a Mori image that may appear in these non-vision areas. It's certainly not exclusive to, to shadow box conditions, but certainly a consideration. And as you can see, it can go from fairly mild in a, in a uh, architecture and aesthetic um, uh, scale of consideration to, uh, some might say this is a fairly serious um, uh, and certainly pervasive uh, across the, uh, the podium of this particular building. The other challenges that we're faced is um, energy. And energy in terms of uh, sustainable tall building design and, uh, and, and really building for the future is to be cognizant of not just energy policy, but of our own carbon footprint. And to manage and deal with this, we really are 
are, are dealing with uh, either through ourselves, our own industry relations, or through regulation more often than not, at least in the North American context and, and certainly in the European context, regulations to manage and identify, to manage it and to manage you have to identify what those thermal characteristics are and, uh, and to be able to confidently um, uh, portray that information out as well. And as I said, just to give it you a flavor, I, um, I, this is, uh, slide's a little bit more North American oriented, but there are, there are international codes that are very similar and parallel. But when we talk about the context of energy conservation and energy efficiency, uh, at least at the regulatory level, we're looking at the uh, International Energy Conservation Code, uh, certainly uh, ASHRAE 90.1, which seems to be the backbone of much of, uh, of what international energy standards are. Uh, then we have our REACH codes or REACH standards uh, at ASHRAE 189.1, which is our green building. Uh, then we have uh, building labeling systems uh, like LEED uh, through the US GBC and, and, and uh, GBCI. Uh, LEED version 4, which was uh, uh, not recently, uh, it's probably about a year that it was adopted, but now, uh, now being enforced. And from a net zero approach, uh, um, in terms of net zero buildings, and there's an international coalition for that, uh, living building challenge, and of course the AIA 2030 challenge to reach net zero for new constructions by 2030. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how can we, as an industry, take a look at this one component and analyze it and review what are its characteristics? And, and there's certain... Uh, discussions that have been going on in the industry for many years, and we're looking at the ability to, or the desire to quantify it right now. And, but to fundamentally, let's just, just kind of peel the onion a little bit and talk about what are the various different control layers. And what I call control layers are those layers on the building enclosure that provide protection against a certain phenomenon. In blue here is what I call the water layer, or the water control layer. This is we have this opportunity through this plane to manage water, rainwater. It's typically bulk water. In this next plane is, is we control uncontrolled, or we manage uncontrolled air infiltration. And uh, there are studies, if you uh, do simple arithmetic based on the US DOE studies of uh, commercial buildings uh, uh, um, occup or consuming 40% of a building's uh, energy use through heating and cooling, and uh, do a little bit of uh, do a little bit of arithmetic, um, just to kind of keep the conversation going, can contribute to a to a, a reasonable number uh, amount of energy loss. One could argue, and we could have this debate both inside this room and outside, anywhere between twenty and percent, twenty and twenty five percent. And the ultimate component here that we'll be talking about today is the thermal control layer the capacity for the system, or at least this part of the system, to manage thermal losses, either heat evacuating from the inside out or heat coming from the outside in. And in this, in this context, you will see that we had two distinct straight lines on the far exterior of the building, but here we have a little bit of a jog. And in terms of uh, fundamental building science, we really do want to ensure and we've learned this with air and water. Manage it at the furthest point outboard as possible. And I think we could probably make the same argument for thermal, for, for thermal performance as well in terms, of, in terms of thermal resistance. And what we find in part of this discussion to be a little provocative perhaps is these, these spandrel systems, these shadow box systems are typically to be found, and we'll show this through example here with a couple of models later, they're they're, they're typically thermally inefficient. Um, uh, we, we've broken the ideal line of the thermal control layer. The actual actually jogs in and starts to expose components of the framing system. And these will show through a few models, and just as, as basic as they are, can uh, reveal some uh, uh, interesting results. And certainly talk about some potential solutions that we might be able to explore. In tackling this, we uh, did some basic modeling. Now, obviously, we'll want to start with a benchmark. We we'll want to model in therm what we do today. Now, let's be clear about what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with a very rudimentary 
non-system, uh, non-system or uh, uh, non non-proprietary specific or, or manufacturer specific system. Very generic, took some basic tubes, uh, you know, uh, basically took the horizontal, cut it in half, even took it to about 900 millimeters, three feet tall, just so that we can create a reasonably controllable model for the sake of conversation. And all these models were done exactly the same way with slight modifications to ensure that we're able to make some comparisons about different technologies and different applications that might be, uh, that might be useful in the context of our discussion. When you look at this, you notice that uh, we have a, and there will be a table to kind of summarize this a little bit later on. Uh, if you can see it, it's a 0.686. This is somewhere along those lines. It, it is tabulated a little bit earlier, but more importantly, you just take a look at this this image over here in terms of this, this blue area over here. This is typically room temperature over here. And by the way, we used a, uh, we used a, a standard uh, modeling um, temperature ranges. Uh, in this case, it's a delta T of about 39 degrees Celsius. And we're, deal we're looking at a large cold space here. This is your typical construction. Uh, insulated glass, uh, 70, 50 to 75 millimeter space, probably 75 millimeters in this case. Uh, three millimeter aluminum panel that's painted. Uh, filled with mineral at the back, uh, uh, vapor retarder doesn't really make a huge contribution in the U factor over here, uh, and it's an aluminum system with uh, what we're going to call a glazed cassette. So it's basically the glass is structurally glazed to an aluminum cassette, and then it's engaged into the aluminum system over here uh, intermittently. So that that's what we have in terms of a typical case now. Just to explore and to enhance the conversation, we like to try to take the metal component out of the consideration. And uh, oops, before we go there. So back to the conversation, my apologies, back to the conversation about thermal inefficiencies and about the temperature ranges. We'll just go back to over here where this was all very cold. This is all essentially still exterior temperatures. And we run the risk of potential phenomenon that we possibly see here. It gets so cold and there's a moisture component on the surface of the mullion where between the moisture component and the, the cold exterior air, we experience frost uh, and a high degree of condensation in this particular example. So try to address that. We'll say, well, we want to try to warm the mullion system. And how we can try to do that is we explored trying to pull away and strip away as much of the aluminum component as we could because aluminum, as we all know, um, I, as I found out last night, was, uh, uh, some of the aluminum components I charging my phone, I got zapped. Well, they're very conductive. So, um, so it was a shocking experience. Um, uh, so what we do try is to kind of create that separation. And we, we've modeled this using structural silicone in this particular application. We just stripped out all the aluminum and uh, inserted the structural, uh, uh, structural silicone and saw uh, a slight drop, uh, 6 one hundredths. Um, uh, uh, six one hundredths of uh, in, in U factor uh, decrease, um, probably some moderate changes here in, in in the temperature profile over here, but certainly not to the degree where where perhaps we would like in terms of really making an impact from from uh, from, from thermal performance. And then from this, this is kind of well, we've kind of exhausted it, right? Well, we have aluminum and we have possibly some silicone material. Maybe we can throw in some thermoplastics in there, which, that you, which may make an impact. But again, we're still talking to the second decimal place. So we're, we need to start looking and having a conversation about different materials. And potentially, we look at various different materials like uh, uh, fume silica-based vacuum insulation panels that have a, uh, a center of panel R value of uh, approximately 35. Uh, and when you to put this into context, our typical mineral wool is where's the mineral wool? Red. It's about R4.2 uh, in, in the SI uh, uh, context. It's a 0.75 versus a 6.6. So we're looking at almost eight to tenfold uh, uh, step change in performance, and perhaps even maybe not as uh, not as significant, but still a step change is the exploration of perhaps. Uh, aerogel building insulation blanket, which is, again, a silica-based silica uh, component. And with these two opportunities, maybe this would be an introduction to put it into context. Visually, 
this is what the difference in insulative properties would look like if you compared on your left the uh, mineral wool, the block, which is yellow, the block of mineral wool versus the uh, uh, fume silica uh, vacuum insulation panel. Um, just a brief description, the vacuum insulated panel is basically a fume silica cake that's pressed uh, into shape, inserted into a PET, a PET bag that's uh, sputter coated with uh, several layers of uh, aluminum coating, uh, put under vacuum to have all the air evacuated out of it, so all the extremely small fume silica particles have an opportunity to kind of blend and, 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 and dovetail together, creating an arduous path for heat transfer to occur, which is why that has that eight to 10 time factor in terms of thermal performance. And another exploration is you know, having a discussion about an aerobic gel blanket, which is in this current form that's shown in this image is about four millimeters thick, has a R value of about 9.8. Again, it's uh, just to do my fuzzy math here, this is a 1.73 uh, RSI value. And it's, the difference is that that's a malleable material. It can be it could be uh, uh, fastened, it could be screwed, it could be uh, adhered. And with that, we go back to our previous image. If you all remember that those line diagrams where I showed the air control layer, the water control layer, and the thermal control layer, we start addressing some of these components in a generic context. You know, how can we start making an impact at these areas that are exposing the aluminum components? Well. For modeling's sake, we looked at this approach and we said, well, you know, we really want thin materials where they're going to make the most impact and we want the flexible material to be where we, uh, to be the non-flexible material to be protected and somewhere where we can manage it and the, the more flexible materials where we can. So here in the green, this is where the, in subsequent models, we've inserted the vacuum insulation panel. And as you can see, having that kind of thermal insulative component and properties uh, just staying within the same geo geographic area, so to speak, at a microscopic level, uh, sorry, at a, 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 well, not microscopic, but a, certainly a smaller scale level, uh, we can certainly start exploring and imparting a higher thermal performance characteristics in that center of panel location. And of course, trying to address those, uh, what, what I uh, term as those thermal bridging components, those areas where just heat is might not necessarily be able to pass freely through here, but finding its way through here and out uh, through, that, through that methodology. So we're, here we have is a couple of more cases where we take a look at uh, incorporating these. And very simply, the red is where the aerodrome blanket is. This is where one would insert a vacuum insulation panel. And just looking at this number, that's 0 0.4731 U-factor. So we've made some, a, a pretty step, a significant step change in terms of performance uh, based on this model. And you can start seeing the, the temperature lines of the temperature isotopes kind of leveling out. And if you recall the images from the previous ones, these were blue. These were almost purple, almost the exterior temperature. Now it's a little bit more tealish, uh, but the, the cold line is very clearly following the line of your insulation. Sorry, just in this context, it was using structural glazing in that, in that area as well. Just to create some separation between the, uh, uh, between the exterior and the aluminum component, uh, decided to experiment and say, well, what would happen if we separated the aluminum, broke the thermal bridge, and inserted you know, some high-performing aerogel blanket over there? Uh, and in this context, we came out with a U factor of 0.425. And again, you start seeing the temperature lines kind of gradually moving out towards here. This is a very nice bright green. This warm room temperature is starting to move a little bit further into this zone. And of course, we kind of wrap it up by, by, by replacing the, that aerogel component with maybe a thermal plastic. As I mentioned it earlier, we said, oh, why not? Let's throw it in there. It's an available material and see what it does. Well, it went to 4.4227. So approximately the same. So it becomes a judgment call. It becomes a discussion and it becomes a dialogue about how we want to deal with those types of, uh, types of framing systems. So just to summarize really quickly, and this is probably the crux of this discussion here, is we had a base case, which uh, was shown to be about 0.668. And as we subsequently went through those different iterations, those di design concepts, we saw a gradual increase uh, in terms of percentage 
in improved thermal performance characteristics. And as we moved through the structurally glazed, had an incremental improvement, we went to the stru uh, structurally glazed with the vacuum, the VIP and the aerogel blanket, another jump, probably a bigger jump. We went from a 6% uh, um, improvement to a th almost 30%, 29.2%. And then we can go as far as 36.7, depending on how we want to man manage and, and, and manipulate the other designs. But that, that really requires a team effort and a conversation of a much larger collaboration that involves more people. But it starts with the desire to reduce the carbon footprint, reduce the energy, uh, 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 the energy demand uh, the, uh, by our uh, exterior facades, and provide an opportunity to maintain aesthetics. And these are the considerations and the balance and the trade-offs or the dance of compromise as some of us would actually to, uh, to, uh, 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 use and, uh, uh, to coin a term. It's about balancing aesthetics, thermal efficiency, meeting U-value, U-factor characteristics for, an, uh, for a specific exterior, maintaining or maximizing vision areas while still be responsible for shading coefficient and glare control, uh, and at the same time being being the professionals that we are, modeling, modeling and validating through testing. And, and in the context of lead version point four, I throw uh, you know, the possibility of building closure commissioning in terms of checking post-occupancy, uh, at occupancy and post-occupancy. Then there is the, the, there's those fire code considerations where I mentioned earlier, is, is those non-vision areas are pretty much part of the, 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 the language of those buildings because at those floor bypass locations, most of, our, most of our building codes require fire separation and that's where it's going to occur. There are ways to manage that, but in terms of the context of how we do it today, we're gonna to have to manage that. And then there's the ever philosophical question about shadow boxes, do we vent them versus not venting, which contributes to the serviceability and the durability and the aesthetics of the whole thing. Uh, because uh, it, it, you know, there's, a, there's a component of dust control and, and acidic pollutants occurring and existing inside the chamber. And of course, in the end, we talk about thermal performance. It all, it all boils down to how, how well does our glass and glazing system uh, and our aluminum system perform from a from a thermal perspective, uh, both under cycling and from you know, glass strength perspective in terms of heat, potential heat buildup and, and whatnot. So on that note, um, some provocative thoughts and discussion that I leave you with, and I thank you very much for your time this morning and look forward to carrying on our discussion later this morning. Thank you.